Michael, I did my doctorate, uh, I hate to say it, almost 50 years ago. Uh, and it was on the cerebral cortex, the electrophysiology of the cerebral cortex. Uh, this is an area that you've worked in, and uh, what have I missed over the last 50 years? Oh my, <laughs> enormous amount. Uh, the, uh, the cerebral cortex, uh, of course, has um, what, what's called localization of function. So the cerebral cortex, this uh, thick outer structure on the brain, right. uh, massively expanded in more recent evolution, mammals and especially primates. And one of the great discoveries um, of the 1800s now was that the uh, cerebral cortex has specialized units mm -hmm. in it that do different things, you know, vision and movement. And uh, what's happened is this map has been slowly filled in. It's almost like a map of the world slowly being filled in. Yeah. Uh, so the visual system, uh, most people don't know this, but something like slightly more than half of your cortex is devoted to vision. Right. It's incredible. And it's filled up with, by now, probably about 60 different distinguishable areas that each do something slightly different and hook to each other in incredibly what, complicated ways. What are some of these ways. differences, for example? Uh, well, for example, there are regions that seem to specialize in recognizing very complicated objects, even faces. There's spots that seem to have a particular emphasis on recognizing faces. Uh, there's areas that seem to specialize in visual motion, how things are moving, quite regardless of what's moving. Uh, there's regions involved in um, vision to action, how to guide your hand or your eyes to particular objects. Uh, and all of these, there's a kind of a divide and conquer approach, apparently, to vision. The same thing seems to be true in uh, other a areas like movement. So that's an area that I worked in for many years, mm -hmm. movement uh, control. And, and you know, we, we used to be taught the brain has what's called a homunculus, the little map of the guy in the right. brain. Uh, yeah. With the big tongue. Yeah, the big tongue and the <laughs> feet at the top. And the puzzle of the homunculus for 140 years was that it was quite blurry and different muscles were overlapped in weird ways. Uh, and one of the things that we, we looked at, we, t we did, was to discover why that blurry overlap occurs. It's because it isn't really a map of the body. It's a map of the movement repertoire. Oh. And for example, there's a little region in there in the cortex that uh, when stimulated will cause your hand to close, turn, move to your mouth, and your oh. mouth open. Oh. A fully formed movement. Fully formed movement. And it's a movement that's very common in the movement repertoire. Oh. So these very, very common movements, uh, or types of movements like hand and mouth, or reaching out, you know, or these funny kind of defensive blocking movements, these have little regions. They kind of clump the the functions clump and cluster, yeah. and um, and so there's this very deep underlying principle of organization that similar function clumps maybe to save on wire length or something. Uh, but similar uh, functions clump and this forms maps and, and areas around the, the cortex. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that is a, um, a kind of a horizontal or geographic approach yes. to the cortex. Yes. And how about the different layers in the cortex? This is something that uh, was yes. kind of hot when I was there. Yes, yes. Well, the cortex has uh, classically six layers, but some areas have fewer and some you can subdivide further. Uh, you know, most of the work on cortical layers focuses on um, uh, circuitry and how, uh, um, how particular pieces of information can be computed, uh, inputs and outputs, almost like looking at a transistor chip. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say, on that end, there has not been an enormous amount of progress. It's, it's so difficult to study that in, in the cortex. Uh, so on, on that grounds, the progress has been less. Uh, maybe with increasing improvement in technology to actually uh, study many neurons at the same time and see how they all talk to each other, that, that might move forward a little bit more. Now, a lot of what you're talking about are, are somewhat mechanical functions of, of vision, of movement. How about the, uh, uh, the emotions and yeah. thoughts that, yeah. we, that we have? What, what type of progress yeah. from the cortical point well, of view? One of the things that's happened in the study of the brain is there used to be these areas that were called association areas, yeah. the stuff that nobody knew what they did, so they must do the really complicated things. They've disappeared. And 
what people parietal on the sides. Exactly. Yeah. There's no association areas anymore. They're all eaten up by vision and movement and audition and, and some multimodal areas. And what people have realized is that uh, the highest levels of vision are very cognitive and very um, uh, you know, intellectual or, or uh, uh, very emotional. Uh, all of these things that we think of as, as the, the high level stuff in between is really tied to vision or tied to movement control. Uh, there, there's, there's so much at the highest levels of movement control. I mean, it's, uh, socially we smile, we frown, all these social expressions mm -hmm. that, we, that we use, they're all in the, in the, in the motor system. So the, the association, the blank association areas have kind of shrunk up and disappeared. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating trend over this time. How about the prefrontal areas uh, of the brain and the orbital? These areas uh, were always thought to be the, the specially human parts for yeah. planning and thinking about yeah. the future and social behaviors. Yeah. yeah, very hard to study. In my opinion, still not really understood. There, there have been, there's been some progress. One of the problems is that you can study some of these areas by studying animal models, but you can't study the uniquely human right. regions in right. that way. Right. And so uh, there's a bit of a dearth of understanding, in my view at least, uh, of exactly how the prefrontal cortex plays into uh, these high level functions. I and mean, we know it has something to do with cognitive control. Are they less uh, uh, um, definitive in terms of their um, uh, organization? Yeah. We saw that the, the old, the old association of parietal areas have shrunk. Yeah. How about the frontal areas? Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is anatomically, uh, you can see areas in there. You can see uh, heterogeneity in there. Uh -huh. But what it means is still not clear. So, and, uh, you know, what the right information domain is to understand a mapping in there or whether there even is a mapping in there is, is still very unclear in the mm. prefrontal cortex. Mm. You know, one, one of the things I love about neuroscience is that you, you, know, you can't throw a stone without hitting a mystery. That's what, it's what makes it a great field to be in.